All right, I'm back here with Dr. Jordan Shallow. We are doing a four-part series, and we're gonna break the squat down. We're gonna separate this, the ankles, the knees, the hips, and the bar placement. And I just wanna get your take on some of the do's, the don'ts, some of the variabilities that there are involved in all this, because there's a lot. There is. And that's why we wanted to separate this in four different videos, and we're just gonna spend this first video discussing the ankle and the foot placement. Yeah. What that looks like, pre racks things to look out for. It's gonna be difficult to keep them all separate, because they all yeah, they're all so good. Exactly, so I think starting with the ankle is a good point. So start with the base. Okay. I mean, you build a house on a strong foundation. So I think the ankle, obviously everyone knows you need ankle mobility. Hopefully we're far past the days of that sitting back squat with the straight shin, right? A lot of your viewers, a lot your listeners probably are going to cue, they watch you squat, going to cue that knee forward position. So there's a requisite amount of dorsiflexion that we're going to need to get into. Well, le I want to, let's talk about that a okay. little bit because they're, at, believe it or not, there still is a lot of people that do cue, yes, that cue this when you go to squat that you sit back like you're sitting back in a chair yeah. and that your knees should not go beyond your toes. Yeah. Now, that could be one of two things. It could be bad cueing or it could be immobility in the ankle. So let's address it as the latter, right? Okay. So ankle mobility is necessary to build from the top up, right? But I think that's a little too primary. So everyone knows if we're gonna drive the tibias over, we need to allow for that flexion, that dorsiflexion to happen at the ankle. Hopefully, more or less would be evident throughout as we cue the hip, knee, and the bar. But what I wanna talk about is also foot position. As, it, as like through sort of this plane here where it's like, do we want our toes forward or do we want them way off to the side? Now this is gonna be an expression of a rotation of the hip, but I think one thing we should try and avoid is the toes straight forward model, okay. right? Because we are gonna try and generate all, or force from all three uh, planes of movement of the hip. We're gonna wanna put ourselves in a position when we're in the bottom of the squat that our knees are over our toes in a way where we have generated torque through the hip and now that final resting place under that under that end range of motion that we have that straight line. Now I wanna challenge you a little bit on this because you're definitely the guy that I wanna hear explain this to me. We talk a lot about like the way we walk. So mm. if I walk with my feet and toes straight, why would I not squat down that way? Okay, well you're not trying to maximally load your walk right? Okay. When you're squatting, and this will kind of pertain to the hip, but your foot position is going to indicate the rotation of the femur, okay. right? Now think of length tension relationships of muscles. So if we're all the way forward, that's like me fully lengthening the muscle, right? Okay. If it's an external rotator, this is fully shortened, like okay. we're loading into that torque of the glute med, but okay. as it comes in and it goes forward, now all of a sudden, we're loading into an end range of motion of that glute med, that main external rotator, which let's make it a little bit more uh, transferable. So let's think if this is short, that's like me doing a bicep curl from here. Okay. I can't generate any torque. Same can be said like this, I'm trying to do a bicep, I don't generate much strength here. That peak force is gonna be right in that middle. So that's where we want our toes to express our hips position, Okay. right? So when we get to that bottom position as we rotate out after driving the knees forward, we can generate torque from a sort of peak length tension relationship of that glute med and express it through muscular torque and not torque at the joints. Cause that's the problem when we go straight forward. The intent will be the same, but we're gonna create torque through the actual hinge at the knee, where here, this alleviates actual structural stress on the knee, but allows us to maximize the force of the hip. Okay. I mean, a little off topic, but again, these are all interrelated. So. Ankle mobility, sure, through the sort of through that plane of flexion extension, but also the where you're gonna set your feet up relative to your hips. So the straightforward model should be, again, as dead as the sitting back model because that creates torque through the knees. You're rotating that hinge of the knee. So what we wanna do, obviously, assess for our ankle mobility through that flexion extension, but equally as important, and in my opinion, maybe more important as we sort of climb up the chain, is gonna be where our feet are positioned relative to our hips. Okay. Right? Will it allow for that natural expression of that rotation through the hips, and then put us in a position where we can create that hip stability in our most unstable position? Now, something that this, I told you off air, that was a game changer for me was, you know, I'm a really tall, I'm six foot three, so I have long levers, and, I didn't, I was cued and taught to drop back and that the knees should never exceed it. But then because of that, I couldn't do a squat without totally breaking here. And that my depth was about 90 degrees and then I would have to come back up. I was never able to break into a deep squat until I 
worked on my ankle mobility. And I actually had to address this. This wasn't just a, like allowing the knees come forward. What I would notice, and this is what uh, I would tell clients to pay attention to, how you know if you are limited because of your ankle mobility, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you'll feel your weight start to shift on, on the, onto your toes. Yeah. Or even, even the excessive of your heels coming off. And range of motion is like anything. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? right? So a lot of it can be broken down into like just improper cueing. A good way to assess that, throw your center of gravity, right? So if we use like a counterbalance squat, now the sit back model is dead, right? If I sit back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose the whole movement, right? right? So if I can't keep that weight distribution through my ankles out here, then I don't have the ankle mobility. Then it's not a cueing issue, then it's an actual mobility issue. So, oh. but over time, improper cueing can lead So if you don't have the ankle mobility, you do that, what will you see right there? Oh, you'll, you'll pitch forward. You'll pitch right? over? Because this will intuitively cue you to break in the knees first. So okay. a lot of people just can't break that sit back and then straight shins. So if we do this, sit back straight shins, there's so much extension in my lower back right now. So if we intuitively kind of just drop into that bottom position, what you'll see is you'll get to here and then they'll start to, the heels will start to come up, oh. right? So it's changing. It's basically, are you losing mobility because you're not cueing properly or is a habit of cueing improperly left you with no mobility? Okay. So the counterbalance squat's a pretty good way to assess that from a mobility standpoint. Is it actual mobility or is it just inability to cue properly? So we also, you and I have done a video already addressing some of the movements that you should do before. Yeah, the ankle get, health series. Right, so if you guys have not watched the ankle health series, this is a great series to watch. This was, it was major for me. Once I started addressing my ankle mobility, my squat improved. Uh, a ton, which was crazy to me because I didn't think that that was a major limiting factor. Now, another thing people can do, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, uh, to, uh, what, what I did originally to kind of crutch that was the squat shoes. Yeah. Because the squat shoes kind of uh, alleviates that a little bit, right? It does. It puts you in a... I mean, if you're using it as an accessory and you have the requisite mobility, sure. If you're increasing leverages, if you're using it as that, as a crutch, as a band-aid, then all of a sudden what happens when you have ankle mobility issues with the squat shoes on? you get a bigger heel until you're squatting in stilettos. It's like, it's best to create a buffer outside of the requisite range of motion regardless. Same with like elbow sleeves and cuffs and all that. Mm -hmm. What happens when you have pain when you put your belt on? Yeah. Now you're left with a low back issue that's a lot, a lot more complex to unpack. So making sure that we could wake up from a dead sleep, barefoot, drop ass the grass, and we have all the requisite mobility in the chain to do that. Then if you want to implement shoes as a way of just maximizing your leverages, I'm all for it, but always keeping that buffer zone. Okay, that. good, because I feel like this is how I use squat shoes and my belt. You, the only time you'll see me probably pull either one out is so I'm challenging myself, maybe PR-wise, I want to see, I want to put a stack a little more weight on there. I know that if I put some shoes on there, it's going to be a lot easier for me than if I was to get on there barefoot. But I squat all the rest of the time, barefoot or in chucks, and beltless. Yeah. But then if I'm going to go after something, maybe I put on those. So it's, yeah, as long as you have the mobility and the strength without the implements, then I'm all for it. Excellent, so that's our ankle, our foot. Next video, you guys, we'll start to address the position of the knees. Listen, if you guys like this video, make sure you guys like, subscribe, and share. We drop a new video every single day.